Okay. Well, hi. I'm Jeanette Elizabeth, and I'm here with Richard Appel, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, Richard's music career and some cool things he's done. So, um, we're here on Google Hangout. First time we've ever used Google Hangout, so this is going to be fun. This is very um, exciting. All right. This well, <laughs> it's very exciting. Hi, Jeanette. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, all right, so I was thinking we could start off the little interview with maybe a little overview of what you've done in the past. Um, so I know you've worked a little bit in the industry a couple of years ago. Um, so I don't know if you want to start off a little bit with that. I can I give you a, a, a little summary. I'll try to keep it brief of, of what I've accomplished over the years. Um, uh, yes, you're right. I did work uh, in Sony Music for uh, two decades in the research area, uh, mostly consumer-oriented research, but really telling anybody anything they really wanted to know about an artist or about the uh, the consumers, the buyers of a certain artist, um, and so forth. Uh, also. Around that point, uh, prior to that point, I spent seven years in research for television, and prior to that, I started out my career in doing various things, whether it be on air or copywriting or promotion. I also spent a short amount of time in an advertising agency doing copywriting and doing really everything in a very tiny agency. Um, more recently, I've uh, re-entered radio doing on-air work. I have uh, currently my own internet radio program that runs on two stations and uh, I'm also been teaching the last few years. Uh, I'm a professor uh, of, of rare various media and radio broadcasting courses at uh, both and Felicia College. Um, I think all I've written for I still write for with a magazine or dot com or dot is a one time to be editor for a newsletter bill uh, for top 40 states and, uh, and for labels for top 40 states. And currently, for a couple of series of stories that run on board online, including uh, something called Revisionist History and something else called um, Hot 100's Hottest Weeks. And uh, Somewhere in there, I've also uh, I co-wrote a couple of books about pop culture in the 60s and 70s called Book of Days. Um, and uh, just as a fun thing, I've also written a newsletter about music and radio and pop culture. I've done that uh, about 10 years in about 1996. I think it's everything. I'm, I probably left out something, but that's. Uh, uh, I was also once at time served on the. Uh, still, I'm still a voting member of uh, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Science. They vote the Grammys every year. I once sat on the New York Board of Governors for the Grammys, which was a whole lot of fun. And for years, I put together a uh, a charity event for about uh, I want to say close to a decade, uh, once or twice a year. I put together a charity event for. Uh, people in the music and radio business, um, which we called MT Bowl, which was a music trivia game show uh, with teams that raised money for various charities, including uh, uh, Y Hunger and City Harvest and Music Cares. I think that's everything. I think uh, if I if I keep thinking hard enough, something else will pop up. But uh, that's uh, I think that's the bulk of what I've. Uh, but also, I did something where Sony a couple of years ago and uh, wrote uh, for a couple of uh, music trivia games they put together with one of their clients. Quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I've been on for a while, so uh, I guess that may explain it. <laughs> okay, I kind of lost you a little bit. the The video is a little bit jumpy sometimes, um, but There's I got a delay the just... probably because I'm not when I finish. 
Okay. There's a delay, I and I think also you, uh, you, your, your voice dropped out at some point, so. Yeah. How are we doing now? That's... Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, it, it cuts out a little bit in and out. Okay. But. Okay. Um. So I, when I got there, though, that's very interesting. You worked in the research department in Sony. That's correct. It so was. So uh, what exactly? One... But what'd you say? Oh me! I was just waiting for the question, and you kind of cut out, so I wasn't <laughs> sure what the question was. Um. What exactly does that entail? Like, what kind of, what kind of things do they have you do? Um, well, really, to be honest, when I said before that we did anything, anything people wanted to know, that's really what it was. We knew what was coming around the corner every time we did something we did on a regular basis. We, um, for years, we worked with a band of buyers of music consumers. And uh, get on their buying habits, also their lifestyle habits, to try to match what um, consumers, what kind of consumers are more likely to be interested in certain artists. So uh, one of the things that we turned out the, in the department were profiles artists that were signed to Sony Music. So whenever an artist had a new album coming out or a new project coming out, the way it worked was we had databases on the entire charting history of the artist. We could pull up. We had all the awards the artist had won, all of the certifications from the RIAA, all the uh, estimated sales of all of their albums and singles and videos, uh, plus we had the demographic profile of that artist's consumers. So we knew what percent were teenagers, what percent were aged 25 to 49, et cetera, et cetera. And beyond that, if we had any other qualitative information from any sort of focus groups or any type of research that was ever conducted about an artist, we threw that in the mix as well. Uh, oftentimes, we, um, I should go back and read my resume to remind me of what I did. It's been a long time because we, we were involved in so many projects over the 20 years. And it changed. As you can imagine, from the time I started until the time I left, the priorities in the company certainly changed as we went from cassette to CD to digital to uh, whatever it is now. Um, well, really streaming and so forth. So... There were all the there. There were always different priorities. Um, there were a lot of times uh, they would come to me in terms of when should we release the single? At what point does it saturate the radio audience? At what point do we want to get it out there so people can buy it back? When that was a when that was something that was important in terms of the physical nature of a single. Um, we also. Sometimes we played a and R for people. I remember one assignment we we got, we they signed a reggae band and they asked us to come up with a whole bunch of songs from the 1970s. The reggae band might remake and potentially make a hit. So I would just go through and come up with a laundry list of potential songs to record. I, I don't think they ever did any of them actually, but. Um, and we also were involved in focus groups. There was a lot of focus group research in terms of, uh, and it's funny because I was discussing this with one of the classes I teach today. We were talking about research in the business and the idea that most of the research that I was involved in was survey research in terms of uh, uh, giving, finding random people or people who were buyers of a certain artist and uh, letting them, having them take a survey about their attitudes about that artist and to try to relate what they're interested in, what kind of songs they like. But we all did live music tests where we would play uh, new songs, uh, not yet released songs, by a major artist for potential fans and current fans artists to find out, well, which one do you like best, which one do you keep on imagine hearing on radio, and so forth. At one time when uh, the internet was kind of an infant, we used to do live online focus groups. We had a panel of people. We had hundreds of people uh, that we would uh, enlist 
on a weekly basis to come online and sometimes we would play for them over the air in the, in the early part of the internet several songs from an artist but we wouldn't tell them who the artist was and just get their general idea of how they felt about the songs what could be a hit or could it be a hit at all and sometimes we even test the album art we would have different shots of the artist in various places asking what they thought of the possible album covers the back covers uh, all of that stuff uh, for a while we also I also served on one of the labels committees they used to have meet weekly where they would play us various projects that weren't released yet and ask like in, a, in a kind of an open meeting uh, situation, what should we promote this? What should single? What's the best way to reach fans? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the questions always change through project to project situation. And you know, I, I thought about it for long enough. I could probably come up with about 300 other possible uh, projects that we did in because there were so many different departments. We handled uh, information for jazz, for classical, for, for R&B, for really every genre, uh, certainly for pop and rock, but also for um, catalog products, for um, putting together compilations of songs that were thematically related, uh, or special products that were only available in certain places, not necessarily in, in retail stores. I mean, this is an era when retail was so important. Now, of course, everything has changed to a point where, not that it's unrecognizable, but it would be a lot different to be working in that business now because of what's important in terms of selling, in terms of exposure, in terms of getting records on the radio. Uh, the priorities have they, they change to some extent, but really, when you get right down to it, the main thing is still for the music industry getting songs uh, into the hands of consumers or getting them so they hear them, whether on various uh, websites or on the radio, um, just to to bring a song up to make it a hit record. That's that's never changed, and it probably will never change. Wow, so it's a lot of things you guys did with, like, I'd say, um, like, numbers and more of, like, opinions. They're asking you, you know, what do you think the single should be? Or um, it's very, I feel like it was very opinion-oriented in terms of what's going to happen next, whereas now it's, it's, let's look at Shazam, let's look at, Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at social media. Well, you're, you're absolutely right because now that research is just a lot more. Certainly, the Internet allows us to do automatic research, it seems, for most, of, for most things. Um, you can look at Shazam. You can look at the activity on Spotify. You can look at review to Now, you can get information that's demographically based. I don't know if that exists. I assume it does. I don't know if the labels have um, a way to get that or if they're allowed to see that. Certainly, that would make a big difference. Um, I imagine a lot of the research that's being done now at the labels is still is still proprietary. It's still something that is done independent of all these things. Maybe also on the intercept people. You after this. To you, you go on a website, something pops up and says, Hi, would you like to take a survey? Uh, some of that might still be from the various companies in the music industry. There are really only three major companies in the industry, which was another change. When I started in 1991, there were, there were six or seven major music companies, which wasn't a lot, but that was down from maybe uh, 50 uh, about 20 years earlier. Now we're down to three. So that's a bigger factor, too. You have more power concentrated in the hands of fewer companies, and the majority of the songs on the radio come from those companies. And even the labels that are called independent labels often have distribution deals with one of those three companies. So when you get right down to it, it's probably close to 99.999% of 
what gets played on top 40 or or adult contemporary uh, comes from major companies. Right. That's that's something that we do discuss a lot. Um, the fact that there's there's these major labels and then there's independent labels that sometimes you know it, it's a lot harder for an independent artist to get on the radio or to try to to get the right connections to get to the radio because the major labels are, are so powerful. Um, and I don't know what your opinion is on that. I know you do work in radio now and you do know uh, quite a bit, I feel, about about radio, especially back um, a couple of years ago. Now everything's changed, but um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, sure. And I know I did have a question um, from a couple of people, but Andrew wanted mm -hmm. to know, it's kind of a good segue, um, how the industry has changed since you've been in it those 20 years ago to now. Well, the real way the industry has changed is, is that the consumer has, has gotten more power because of the digital nature of the business. When I started in 1991, people would many consumers would be asked the question well can't find on a single on a, a, a 45 or a cassette or CD single where you buy a whole album just to get the one song that you really like we could ask this question because there wasn't any other way to know there was no digit with digitality is that a word there's no other way to get a song Sometimes you can get it by getting an import if a single was available on an import. But at that point, people, uh, people's fascination with singles had long passed. And throughout the 1980s and 90s, there were not many uh, very, very big selling single records. Nowadays, of course, with digital song, it's all about the single. Everything things on a song that can sell five or even six or seven million uh, digital tracks or digital files, whatever you want to call it. Um, but in the 90s, the consumer really didn't have much of a choice. The consumer was often uh, under the, the gun, if really wanted a song they liked, to shell out the times $18 just to get an album with one song that he really wanted. And throughout the 90s, during that decade, labels released less and less commercial singles. Uh, so a lot of the big radio hits in the latter part of that decade were uh, songs that the consumer could not buy as a one-off. There was no a la carte for a lot of those songs. But then when digital uh, came to, you know, got everybody's notice, and when uh, Napster came out in, I think it was 99 or 2000, and consumers quickly got the buzz. They could download any song they wanted. Everything changed. That was the big turning point in the year, I guess it was the year 2000, when uh, when the whole idea of peer-to-peer, -peer, which you know, was and, and really still is a legal practice, but it came to be one of something that everyone knew about, and certainly the industry had to respond to that. And it took a long time to do that. It took at least three years for iTunes to come out. So you really had a wild west of digital song ownership for a few years there. Uh, and then when iTunes hit and when, uh, I guess, Amazon or Walmart or other companies started getting into the digital song sales business, um, everything really turned around. Suddenly, consumers had the power. Any song was a Single. There was no uh, you stuck being an apple. Um, unless, of course, I mean, you were a big fan of a major artist, that was a material situation. You buy the album anyway. If you really loved Mariah Carey or Bob Bolt or Nick Smock or uh, at that point in time, I didn't know. It was in brilliant sync and then for example, who can sell millions of albums even when all their songs be taken free off the internet. 
Um, but with, with iTunes and uh, really what happened over the next seven years or so, uh, the Internet and the consumer became even more powerful because of social media and being able to uh, make a hit record, really, between all the buzz. Then, of course, YouTube came along, which uh, allowed consumers to see or listen to songs whenever they wanted. There, there wasn't, I mean, there certainly was a push for the subscription models where consumers could uh, buy, subscribe on a monthly basis or a whatever basis and have access to every song in the world. And um, that's done so just so much for the Spotify's and so forth. Certainly Spotify has become very successful because for many people it's still free and it still gives them access mm -hmm. to any song they want to play it any way they want. These are all things that the music business was not sold on. choose to stream them if they want to, choose to buy them if they want to, uh, or just hang out and at, uh, at YouTube. But the, uh, the other truth that, that still pervades the industry is, uh, is, as I understand it anyway, is that there are still many people who, if you're a fan of an artist, you will still buy a collection of music by that artist. And what better example exists now than Taylor Swift, you know, where where, you know, how many acts can command millions in sales for an album? We've seen that number go steadily down year after year after year after year, mm -hmm. and now it's, what, three, four? I mean, who who can uh, have that power? I mean, a lot of that is driven by the number of hit singles you have, but sometimes it's not. I mean, Taylor Swift... If you look at the, if you look at a graph, you graph how many hit singles Taylor Swift has had and how many albums she's sold, and it, her graph would be like this, you know, going this way or whatever. Katy Perry's would be going the other way, or Rihanna's is going the other way because they sell tons of individual songs, but their album sales are nothing nearly that special compared to say Taylor Swift or really what Adele sold with her album three or four years ago, where 20 million people worldwide bought that album because it was just such a powerful collection of songs. That doesn't happen all the time. The industry would love to see more of that where people, where a collection of songs comes out that everybody wants to own or has to be part of. Um, and the last few years, we really haven't seen that so much. We have artists that have taken off, and certainly in the last year, songs, individual songs, have become part of our culture to a point where now um, the whole promotion of songs is so beyond radio. It's the idea that everybody, the industry, I believe the goal now is that everybody has to hear them anywhere whether they're put into mm -hmm. commercials or they're used in television programs or movies or uh, they have there's the video systems in the malls. Um, I remember a few years ago when uh, Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe came out, you couldn't escape that song. It didn't matter where you went. It, didn't, it wasn't just radio. It was everywhere you, you looked um, or you, you walked into a public place, some, somebody was playing the song. And certainly there was that way. There's a handful of songs that, that hit that uh, plateau last year, too. But I think as a result of that, though, because of the amount of money that companies have to spend now, the number of priorities have gone steadily down. So you don't see as many hit songs every year. Ten years ago, you could uh, show somebody the, the, the top uh, 50 songs of the year, and they would say, wow, you know, they'd know every one of them. Now, uh, you look at the top songs of this past year of 2014, I think people are lucky if they know eight of them. And you probably mm -hmm. can name the same eight. You know, there were certain songs that just became so powerful. And 
I think all that's also happening as part of that, and I'm going on too long, so just tell me to shut up, is uh, that radio also has been able to pick and choose because radio has become so successful in the top 40 realm, and they're successful at playing the same songs repeatedly because that's what the audience wants and will stay to listen for, that less songs reach a certain level of popularity. The It's the uptown funks that that get played more often, but it's very hard to be an uptown funk these days. One At one point in time, you had 10 songs rotating every two and a half hours, and those were the big 10 songs in rotation that were big in request that everybody wanted to hear. But now, you don't have that type of situation anymore. You don't have a situation where even 10 or 15 songs are that huge at radio but it's really a, a smaller handful of songs that are you know have, that have gone way above and beyond in the public's consciousness, and that's what they want to hear. So as a result, we have way fewer hit records than we've had in a long time, maybe ever. I would agree. That with didn't that. answer the question, did it? <laughs> no, that that answered the question perfectly. Um, I think. I mean, the industry's changed so much over, like you said, now there's there's much less um, hit songs and and much much fewer. I feel like it's a much less variety of sounds. Well, that's that we a good hear. point. There, there's much less variety, and also the audience is easier to track, as you pointed out really earlier, the audience is much easier to track than it ever was because you can look at what's happening online. You know what they're talking about. You know what they're tweeting and what they're Instagramming and, 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 and what they're posting and what songs they're mentioning in Facebook, what they're watching on YouTube and Vivo, um, and, and what they're playlisting in Spotify. So mm -hmm. you can see the pattern of a hit record, but nowadays because of the way people discover songs, and many of them discover them not on radio, but discover them on the internet or through word of mouth or other buzz online, it often takes a song that's by an, an artist that no one knows close to a year to become a hit record. It'll be between the time it first shows up and first gets that buzz to it's being used in, uh, well, certainly being watched on YouTube and uh, shazammed and added on Spotify and uh, used in television shows, et cetera, et cetera. And you can probably come up with a whole bunch of examples of songs like that where uh, the, the, uh, the, the journey from first release to being number one or number two or whatever took close to a year to get there especially for an act that no one knew, like, for example, Hosier. You know, no one knew who Hosier was. One song changed all that. And that's been the case for so many acts. I mean, Iggy Azalea, another example of that, or Megan Trainer, for that matter. It's yeah. amazing. I think it says a lot that most of the past year's biggest hits have been by acts that weren't um, the super artists, they were they were from really hungry new acts that just found a certain sound or a certain song with a certain message that everybody jumped on, that everybody thought was right. great. And you know that too because you see it on YouTube. The more the more popular a song gets, the more the more people want to sing it themselves. You know the whole voice phenomenon yeah. has moved on to YouTube. So you have people singing the songs, you have people producing parodies of the songs. So the footprint of an all about that bass is much huger, huger, that were more huge um, now than songs that were hits four or five years ago that didn't necessarily have all those options. So the consumer has such power, they can make a hit song even bigger. Um, and also other artists can make it bigger too because other artists cover each other's songs um, right. on, on YouTube or on shows like the voice and so forth. Um, so yeah, they, so what you were saying is right. That's that's a big part of what's happening is the fact that that the the music consumer is so easy, much easier to to watch and track 
and, and it's easier to see what's going on at any time. Right, yeah. Um, okay. I kind of want to get on to a little bit of a different topic just because you've done so many cool things. Um, but I know you have your own radio show, and I kind of want to talk about that a little bit because I find it very interesting. You host an online radio show, is that correct? It is, yes. The show is, uh, well, it's, it's technically, it's online when it starts. It is, um, when I do the show live, which is Sunday night, 6 to 9 p.m., on rewoundradio.com. I'm plugging the show now. Uh, the show is called That Thing with Rich Appel. And if you like older music, I mean, this is not a, uh, the show in the, in the format of the station is music from really hit songs from the uh, from rock and roll forward, so the 1950s, the late part of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, maybe some of the 80s, maybe a smidge mm -hmm. of the 80s. So I follow that same format, and the show that I do live on Sunday nights, uh, six to nine Eastern, is that I mentioned that already. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, is um, is basically made to be a kind of a celebration of not just that music, but the way radio was at its peak when it played it. Uh, the top 40 format in the 1960s and 70s was very fast paced um, and it was very personality heavy. Um, entertaining the listener was very important. When you listen to top 40 radio during that era, the disc jockey was just as important as the music itself. And, and part of the reason that was is because there were so many top 40 stations on both AM and FM that kids could just, I mean, the way the internet is now, there was certainly no internet. There was no YouTube, no Spotify. All of those things were radio stations. So, and I remember this from being a kid and seeing my older brother and sister take over the uh, console stereo that we used to have in the living room. And they would spend all night just flipping channels from one station to another, from one band to another, because at night, the all the signals of the more powerful radio stations from other cities could break in to where we were, and this is true all over the U.S. and world, for that matter. So if you wanted to hear all your favorite songs, you just had to keep twisting the dials to find those songs. But also, every one of those stations on AM and FM had different disc jockeys, and all the disc jockeys, especially at night, had different shticks. You know, everybody was entertaining in some way. Um, disc jockeys were allowed to talk after just about every record. Actually, back then, it was every record. That was important. So uh, that's the kind of radio I've, I've been trying to bring back for those three hours. Mm -hmm. We also include, we have our own jingle package for the show. We kind of take pieces of a lot of the other old jingles from that era and smash them together with the... Uh, with our jingles, plus we play a lot of the old commercials. We do commercial breaks of, uh, of commercials that were around back then. Um, and we have silly features. We do a feature called uh, The World's Shortest Countdown, where we just uh, count down two songs and ask people to tell us what is the world's shortest countdown of. Um, we also do something called the Slow Dance Makeout Song of the Week, which is an excuse to play one real cool slow song from any of those eras. And uh, we have uh, something called The Year in an Hour, where the second hour, most of the time, is devoted to all songs from one year. And uh, we ask a trivia question about that year, and we'll, um, they will play some sound bites from that particular year and talk about what was going on in terms of TV and fashion and, and so forth. Uh, what am I forgetting about? I think there's some other things that we do. Oh, we have a, a feature. One of the more popular features in the show is called Needles and Spins. And uh, in this feature, what we do is um, we've asked people on a regular basis, and oh, they can write to us, and we ask them to t uh, share their memories about a certain song. Like, where were you? What do you remember about this particular song? You know, tell us a song. Tell us a story behind it. What when you hear a song, what does it remind you of? You know, is it somebody that you were dating, or so, or, or some trip you went on, or was it uh, being out of the country and hearing the song, or or? And we've heard all kinds of crazy things. Um, this past Sunday, we had a couple of needles and spins, and also as part of that. 
instead of playing the digital song, the digital file of the song, I actually play the old 45. I have the original 45 of every song. So uh, when some when I tell somebody's story on needles and spins, I go right from that into just putting the needle down as we did in the 60s and 70s on the actual record. Uh, which gives it a different sound. Hopefully the listeners can appreciate and hear, or they'll hear the clicks and the pops on the records. They'll know that it's vinyl as opposed to the usual ultra-clean digital. Um, so we do that. Uh, that's a, a big, a very popular feature. We, every week we try to um, have a different story and a different song involved. And, uh, and also another thing that we do that really you don't hear anywhere else is we look at... Um, what's happening every week when the show is on um, in terms of the, the, the various dates during the week, whose birthday is it? Who was born on this week um, in history? What events took place that might be of interest? And it's those that dictate the music of the show. The, most of the music, probably about 80% of the songs that I play are dictated by the events because we match all the birthdays and events to certain songs that uh, have to do with whatever the uh, the event or the person's birthday or so forth is, um, and you won't really want to hear that anywhere else because certainly on conventional radio everything is playlisted. Everything is all right. disc jockeys yeah. on major stations have a list in front of them on the computer, and you can't stray from you can't vary from that. And most of the time, uh, the the songs that are listed have nothing to do with what happened that day. You don't have that same kind of interaction. Um, you're not allowed to have that same kind of interaction with the music or the audience, uh, which of course wasn't the case ages ago. Uh, prior mm -hmm. to doing that thing with Rich Appel, I, I did a program on another radio station, actually a couple of stations, where I played around with that format. And the response was always very, very good. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this program is that it runs two times. At least now it does because it runs live on Sunday night on Rewind Radio and then runs again on Saturday night, the following Saturday, from 7 to 10 Eastern on a station called WOLD, which is a, an FM station that's, I think, around Edison, New Jersey, but is also available online. So we get to reach potentially two separate audiences. Some people may listen twice for all we know. And hopefully we can find other stations that would like to run this show as well as we go on. Um, it's tough because not a lot of stations that play older music want to go that far back. Uh, most stations today, it's pretty much 70s and 80s or even 80s forward, uh, which is fine for them and right. fine for the audience. But I, I think we're trying to do something that nobody else is doing. So, and I think we've done pretty well with it so far. We, I started this program in December, and uh, this will be the 20th show this coming Sunday. And uh, the the feedback, because one of the big things about the program is the the uh, online feedback. Because while I'm doing this, we have a, a room or a page on Facebook for the program, so people will post stuff in that room while the show is happening. They'll answer the trivia questions or make comments about the songs. Um, and uh, that's a big part of it. And we also have a little bit of a Twitter presence. And well, we continue to grow it. We're trying to reach the listeners wherever we possibly can. We, you know, my, it's my thought, and the feedback has been so good. Uh, and and it, it's very encouraging to know that a lot of people who are frustrated with the fact that they can't find these songs on terrestrial conventional radio mm -hmm. anymore are going to places like Rewound or WOLD to get them. So I'm just happy to be able to, to be one of the people to bring it to them. That's, that's really interesting because um, I know that's true being, being my age. I mean, I listen to the radio and I don't hear, you know, songs that are older. We hear very mainstream, current. They want to just kind of keep throwing it at us. Um, but I think one cool thing about technology now is that people can go to your show and, and can listen to a station. and They have so many options, really, to, to hear songs that are older and that might not be played now on, like, you know, current radio. Um, and that show is just very interesting. I'm, I know you do it all at 
do you do it from your house? Do you have your own studio? I do it. I do it about uh, two feet from where I'm sitting right now, talking to you. <laughs> um, it's actually on the other side of this computer. If I was to walk around with this phone, I could show you and give you a tour of what we call the Chestnut Cabaret on the on the show, which is really the bar here in the house where the show emanates from, and it's really all about. Um, the computer. I mean, the guy. We load all the songs into a computer program. Uh, figure out all the timing in terms of when one song ends, when one begins, where the jingles go, where the commercials go, where I go, and so forth. And uh, right up next to, it, I mean, in in a weird, strange way, like the Flintstones meet the Jetsons next to the computer where the where the show is coming out of. You know, where, where it's where it's. Um, really where all the action is, uh, is the turntable that I'm playing the old records on needles and spins. But I've also got a CD player there. I've got a cassette player. So if I really wanted to, I could play music from all of those on this show. Not that I've done that, but it's though that that technology exists because everything is going through one, one mixer and whatever's up on that mixer. I mean, I have the, the sound of my television in the mixer. I wanted to play something from the TV on the radio show, I could do that too. Not that I, not that I would do that, but it's just, it's, it's interesting how the whole technology kind of meshes and and goes crazy together. Um, but the the end user, the consumer, they don't care about that. They just want to hear the songs and hopefully be entertained in between the songs. I can tell that you're very passionate about about your radio show. That's really really cool that you do it all. You know. By yourself, um, I well, we're running commute. out of time. <laughs> uh, we only have time for maybe a, a little bit more, but okay. um, so I did want to touch on the fact that you are a teacher at um, Seton Hall and Felician College, and you teach. Mm -hmm. um, you're in the media department. Uh, I mean, it depends on the school. I guess that's I guess that's true in both cases. I'm in the communications department in uh, really both schools, um, and the, the the definition of what that is and what courses I teach varies from one school to the other. At Seton Hall, I've taught two classes. One is called Introduction to Radio, which is really takes you through the history of the medium from the very beginning. Of uh, you know from Marconi and other people who were figuring the whole thing out in the 1800s right through to today and where radio is. Uh, but then for a more focused view on how radio is today, the second course I teach, which I'm wrapping up right now, is called Contemporary Radio and Convergence, which is really an overview of all of radio today, not just over the air, but all the competitors online with Pandora and Slacker and really all the other things that are uh, that ra that conventional radio is now adapting and using and leveraging to make their product more powerful and to reach more people. Whether it's doing shows on YouTube or creating playlists on Spotify or uh, using social media to bring more listeners to the station and bring listeners together. Uh, so all of that comes into play in that second course. At Felician, I teach uh, mass media, which is exactly what it says. It's really an overview of all mass media from print to broadcast to internet, uh, really right through history. Um, I also teach a course called uh, Seminar and Broadcasting, which I'm teaching also right now this semester, which uh, is really a review of just everything that someone who wants to be on the air needs to know and do. In fact, as part of the class, we do about, uh, we've done about six labs, if you will, at Felician's radio station, WRFC, where the uh, students put together short programs, whether they're news broadcasts or commercials or just talking about stuff or mixing music in just to, to get a feel for what, you know, what radio is and how to make it as, as powerful and as effective as it can be. 
Um, what have I uh, not mentioned? Um, oh, I, I'm coming up. I'm teaching. Uh, I will be teaching public speaking, and I believe also I'll be teaching uh, broadcast journalism going forward. So uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Wow. Okay. You've you've definitely got your foot in a whole bunch of different parts of the music industry, not only in research but radio and now teaching. That's really really awesome. Um, okay, that seems to be all the time that we have right now. Um, thank you so much <laughs> for Thank you for that. It's been a lot of fun. This was very interesting. Um, and maybe we could do it again sometime. <laughs> Just name the time. We'll, uh, I'll come up with more things that I do. If I even have to make them up, I'll come up with them. But uh, it's, it's been a great ride, and uh, it's, it, honestly, it's just so much fun to, uh, to, to play with these, these toys we call songs. You know, it's to, the music is such a great, it's, it's a great business, and I've always loved music since the time I was like a baby. So, uh, and I've always been uh, enamored with hit songs since I was five or six years old. So to do that now, to do anything with that, you know, whether it's being on the air or teaching or writing about it, is always a thrill. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, have a good rest of your night, and hopefully see you soon. Okay. Yep, I look forward to that, Jeanette. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.